Hello boils and ghouls, how's it going? It's Douglas here at Drown Boy Productions, bringing you a redo of my Scream 1 movie mask guide. So the first guide that I did was made with the most up-to-date information on the masks, on the info that was available at that point in time. I tried to make sure that everything was up to date and correct. However, there have been a few things cleared up since then, so I wanted to go ahead and redo this video for those purposes alone. So with that being said, let's talk about the history of the masks from 1996's cult classic, Scream. So before we get into talking about mask types, let's talk about the mask and its history of how it became involved with Scream. When Kevin Williamson was writing the script for Scary Movie, he had absolutely no idea of what the killer would look like beyond the fact that he would wear a ghostly white mask, possibly to be a reference to Halloween or any of the other killers that were also referenced in the film. Well, after the script had sold, it was up to the production to figure out what the killer was going to look like. So, they had the effects team, k and Effects, start coming up with different designs of what the killer's mask could possibly look like. And while k and Effects was hard at work coming up with the possible new killer mask, the rest of the production was out location scouting. And it just so happened to be that while location scouting for Tatum Riley's house, Marianne Maddalena found that original mask. They had just arrived at the location and Marianne wandered upstairs into the boy's bedroom where, on a bedpost, she found one of these gorgeous white shroud weeping ghost masks. And at the time, Marianne thought that she had just solved a huge problem for production. What was the killer going to wear? Well, it seemed fairly obvious, a ghostly white mask. So she ran downstairs full of excitement and showed the mask to Wes and Bruce Miller, who both were kind of like, mm, we're just going to make our own. We're going to make our own for the production. She was a bit bummed out by that, but ultimately what Wes says goes, so they left the mask there. After getting pretty much everything else ready for production, they were about three weeks out from shooting and they still had no idea what the killer was going to wear or what he was going to look like. KMB effects had come up with all sorts of really cool designs of ghouls, ghosts, goblins, everything in between, but really nothing that was truly iconic or terrifying. It didn't quite strike what they were looking for. So Marianne suggested, well, hey, what about that mask? Why don't you contact that lady and see if she still has it? And they did, and she did and the rest is history. So production then received the White Shroud mask, but they had another problem. You can't put anything on screen that you don't own. So they decided to have the K&B effects group come up with their own. They came up with several different designs, but nothing was quite as good as that original. So they tasked K&B effects with coming up with pretty much a legal parody version of this mask, as close as you can get without it being the same mask. So at that point, K&B removed the White Shroud from the mask and recasted the mask itself to make a latex version, which did have a gray shroud on it. And I do believe that that initial mask was then reshrouded and slightly modified to be used on film. And I believe it was used during the scenes when Casey Becker is being chased through her house and the house is full of smoke. However, at that point in time, they still could not use the original mask on screen because you can't put anything on screen that you don't own. So KMB was tasked with coming up with a legal parody version of the original Fun World mask. So after a few designs and redesigns, this is what they ended up with. The K&B ghost face mask as we all know it. They did the first few days of principal photography using the K&B mask. However, after the dailies made it back to the studio, they ultimately were not happy with the look of the killer. They thought it looked just too goofy, not really scary, not intimidating in any kind of way. And I agree. So prop masters JP and Skip naturally went out and bought a singular Fun World Generation 1 Cotton Shroud Fantastic Faces mask. They shot a few scenes with the Fun World mask and sent those back with the dailies and the studio was much, much happier with that mask. So at this point, production knew that they had to get the rights to use this mask. They then wrote Fun World to get the rights to use the mask on film. And while they were waiting to get the okay from Fun World, they still had to shoot with that k and mask, but they were also still shooting some alternate scenes with the Fun World mask as well. The primary scenes where the K&B were used in the film can be seen during the opening with Casey Becker, as well as Ghostface stalking in the bushes. That absolutely ridiculous scene of Ghostface in the grocery store for some reason, as well as the shots with Principal Hembry. And in fact, the scene with Principal Hembry cutting up all the different masks was the last day that they filmed without multiple masks on set from Fun World. That was the day that they received the box of masks for filming. So. Principal Hembry actually did cut up one of the Fun World masks, which I do believe was that very, very first one ever found, the White Shroud, that ended up on set with all the different modifications. And the reason I believe it to be that mask is because that mask has since then surfaced and is extremely yellowed and obviously cut into pieces. I do believe that this was the one used in the smoke scene, due to the smoke probably causing it to be yellowed, because the rest of the hero masks from the movie 
aren't that yellowed. Unfortunately, I don't have a shooting script to give us an absolute timeline of what masks were used when, in what scenes, in what order they were shot, but at least from the information that I do have available, I do believe this to be correct. As far as the Gen 1 masks are concerned, there are two main hero masks. The first, which closely resembles this mask, would be referred to as the Sydney Attack Mask for obvious reasons. And the second main hero mask used is what we refer to as the Garage Scene Mask because it first appears in the Garage Scene. There were a couple of other fun world masks that were used on film that were modified for stunt or were modified for certain lighting conditions, but these were the main two hero masks that were seen. So for those of you wondering what types of masks were used, the K&B Custom, and the Gen 1 Fantastic Faces. In this video, I will not be doing a shot per shot breakdown of which masks were used in which scene, but if you guys are interested in something like that from me in the future, let me know in the comment section down below and I may do one covering all four screen films. Now, the movie mask guides will be completely separate. This more so is supposed to tell you guys the story of the masks that were used in the film and also help you to identify your own if you're looking for them out there. So the first mask that they used on film was probably the least seen, which is the K&B effects. Yet again, they have made it into the final cut of the film, and there actually are several different versions of the K&B effects mask. What I have here for you guys is probably my favorite version, which is the gray shroud, and of course has the nose finished as so, a triangle nose. However, there were different versions, some of them having a more arrowhead shaped nose instead of that bottom line going straight across. Some of them did have black shrouds and black eye mesh. Some of them, like the gray shroud here, actually had brown eye mesh and gray shrouds. So there are a few different versions, and if you're looking for where you can pick up these yourself, I would strongly recommend Burke Bench Designs, as he seems to make the most accurate representations of these masks, at least so far, and he does offer the different versions of each. Now the next mask, and pretty much the only other mask type used, would have been the main type that JP and Skip went out and bought which would be the Gen 1 Fantastic Faces Weeping Ghost. As for the history of the Fun World Fantastic Faces masks, they were masks that first surfaced as a part of a line called the Fantastic Faces. Obviously, there were several other ghosts that were introduced in this line as well, and they were produced in black and white shrouds originally when they released in 1992. Then in 1993, they started producing fluorescent versions, including the orange, pink, and green variants, and those were all produced up until 1996 when this film was released. There has been much debate over the years whether a Gen 2 was used in Scream 1 or not, and at least as far as we can see, there was no Gen 2 used. The Gen 1 Fantastic Faces Weeping Ghost was used on screen, however, they were not just default as is completely unaltered masks. They did have alterations, though most of those alterations are not known to the public and are not shared with the public because they're kind of minute details that uh, set these apart. And while we're at it, I want to go ahead and dispel a rumor. This is something that I shared as well in a previous video, but has been found to be completely untrue. None of the original masks on Scream 1 were painted white. They all did appear with their natural pigmented vinyl. However, the mask that was mistaken for one of those was on set. This was a piece that was actually owned by Nate Reagan years ago that he received whenever he received many, many different masks from the production of Scream 1. And at this point in time, there was not much knowledge about the different Fun World masks that were made or were out there. And one style that they produced was called an All-in-One, which features pretty much a regular ghost mask, but they are painted a stark white and finished, obviously, with the same black. So they're not glow-in-the-dark masks. I have owned one previously myself that was of the Gen 2 variety. However, they did produce them for pretty much all their different classic ghosts. These are also known as an all-in-one because it features a full body sleeve polyester shroud, essentially. It looks kind of like one of these normal polyester shrouds, but has fabric going all the way down, has elastic in the back, and holes on either side. One of these was sent to set, but was ultimately unused in the film. Due to this one mask and specific information about the masks being painted has been spread around. And like I said, I too have spread that information because I thought that that was correct information at the time. But I'm here to tell you now that that is not correct. And that's why we're doing this to update outdated information. Now the next question I know you're going to ask is, Douglas, how can I identify what is and isn't a Gen 1 mask? And guys, listen up and pay attention because it's going to get a little tricky here. So if you're not quite good enough at identifying the facial features of these masks, the first thing you're going to want to ask for is a picture of the chin stamp, which should state Fun World Div and have a copyrighted C before the Fun World Div. 
No other markings should be present like an HN or an H or anything like that. Next up, your mask should have a cotton shroud, a t-shirt material like cotton shroud. Typically even the streamers can be found rolled up, however sometimes they are found flat. Now I do want to say this, not all Gen 1s will be found on cotton shrouds. A very low amount of them have been found over the years, but recently they have surfaced Generation 1 masks on polyester shrouds. Now technically, if you're trying to achieve a Scream 1 display, or even a cosplay, this should still work perfectly, because it's exactly the same mask, just a different shroud. However, if you want the true accuracy of having exactly what is on screen, you want to look for your typical cotton shroud. Next up, let's talk about measuring. Previously, it was stated that you could measure from the top of the vinyl to the bottom of the chin, and if it was 12 inches, that's a Gen 2. If it's 11 and a half, that's a Gen 1. I was a little bit skeptical on this information prior, and yet again, this is more information that needs to be updated because that's been found to be untrue. The quickest and simplest way to identify your Gen 1 masks are looking for a few key features, and most of those features are going to be telltale in the mouth of the mask. At the time of recording, three molds have been for sure confirmed to be Generation 1, and there's a fourth one that's kind of a, a little bit out there as to whether it's truly a Gen 1 or whether it's not a Gen 1, if you would consider it its own mold, and we'll touch on that in a second. So as for the ones that are truly, truly Gen 1, a few different places you can check is, first off, the easiest to find would be the second dimple, which actually, I'm not going to use this mask as reference, I'm going to use this mask as reference. Maybe you guys will even be able to see it. Right here, at this point in the mouth, right where I'm pointing, you should see a little dimple pressed into the mouth. It just kind of lightly recesses, it's not super deep, but it's definitely enough for light to catch it. Maybe you guys will be able to see it, maybe not. But yet again, right here. Right here on this side of the mouth, you will see this dimple. If you see that, that is for sure a telltale sign of a Generation 1 mask. Since I do have an example of this, I will show you guys on this green Generation 1. This mask belongs to what we call the multi-dot, because it has multiple dots. There is an indention here, slightly above it and to the right, there's an even deeper indention. In the center of the mouth, there's almost a small indention. And on the top left hand side, there are two dots almost stacked. Yet again, all in this topper part of the mouth, you've got to pay real, real close attention for these dots. Those are the easiest to identify. The third mold type is probably the hardest to identify just from pictures, but if you look close enough, you can see them. And in some listings, it's very apparent. Some, you definitely want to ask the seller for more photos. There should be a singular small dot on the top right hand side of the mouth if you're facing the mask, left hand if you're wearing it, at the top of where the mouth indent starts to go inwards where they actually cut the breathing hole. If you pay attention there, there will be one singular small dot. Yet again, this is known as the small dot mold. Every one of those that I just listed is for sure guaranteed a generation one mask, whether it appears fluorescent, whether it appears poly shroud, whether it appears normal cotton shroud. They can be found on all three types, and even, of course, instant disguise masks or the droop hood, as well as all-in-ones, also came featured with Generation 1s. They're very seldom found, but they do exist, so pay attention to those mold types because you never know what you may have. So let's talk about that fourth mold type. This is the ambiguous one. Some people have stated that they believe it's entirely its own mold. Some people also believe that it belongs to the Gen 1 family. Personally, I'm on the side of it belonging to the Gen 1 family, and I'll show you why. The mask that I've been showing you guys here, that I've been stating is a Gen 1, and also showing you how it resembles the Sydney Attack mask, the Hero Mask number 1, this in fact is what we call a splotch mold. Now, typically, these can measure a little bit larger than your standard Gen 1, and that's why the measurement method 100% doesn't clarify anything. Beyond that, really the measurement method's a little bit off because a lot of these masks were hand cut and they could have extra vinyl in the forehead, whether they're an earlier style, one of the three molds I just showed you, or whether they're one of these. But for some reason, typically these seem to be just a little bit larger than your standard Gen 1s. So, the mark that you're going to be looking for is very, very faint and it's almost in the center of the mouth. It's about right there where the end of my finger is. It's a very light indent and it's just kind of a little splotch. It's really, really difficult to explain it 
but it's just like a little mold marking. I, I really can't explain it. It almost looks like a star. These are the exact same sculpture as a Generation 1 and are typically finished exactly like a Generation 1 in the way that the shrouds are sewn, in the way that the nose is painted, the eyes are painted. Typically, they seem to resemble Gen 1s. And that's why I argue that they're part of the Gen 1 family, as well as the fact that when these were found in fluorescent colors, typically they don't have eyeliner, which is one of the telltale signs of a Generation 1 fluorescent mask. So we do know that they were produced at the same time, it's the same sculpture, and they also have the eyeliner differences that were changed with Generation 2 masks. So yet again, my argument for this mold type is that it is a Generation 1, and most other people out there do agree with me on that point. Well, there you go, guys. I think that about covers it for today's video. I hope that this was in-depth as it needed to be. I hope that this helped some of you out there identify your masks a little bit easier. I hope that this helped tell you a little bit more about the origins of the first screen masks used in the original 1996 film. And yet again, if you guys are interested in seeing a scene-by-scene -scene breakdown of the different masks and mold types that were used throughout the films, maybe that's something we can do in the future. Just let me know in the comment section down below. Also, stay on the lookout for a Scream 2 movie mask guide because I will be redoing that as well. And then we will finally be bringing you guys the Scream 3 and 4 movie mask guides. And I'm also thinking about doing one for the TV series as well. So there you have it. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Thank you all for watching. Hope you're having a fantastic October. I love you all and I'll see you next time.